Belker, and I have the privilege of serving as pastor here at Christ Church United Methodist. It's, it's so good to see so many people here uh, this evening, but as you know, you are, you are many in number. So I want us to, to take a moment and just notice how many people are here in the space. Uh, we're setting up some folding chairs, but we're only going to do one extra row of those because we want to make sure people can get in and out safely. Um, if you are someone who's seated and you do well and fine to stand for an hour or so, I want to invite you to kind of look at people who are standing throughout the evening. And if it seems like you would want to get up, I know I like to actually get up and stand around the back because then I can kind of scratch and wander and meander. Um, if it looks like there's somebody who needs a seat, I'll just trust that you will invite that person to your seat and kind of tag in and out of the space. Uh, we have a, a good opportunity to gather and to, to be community here, so we want to make sure that we're, we're all taking care of one another. We have uh, water and some uh, refre uh, refreshments in the back. Uh, there is a men's room and a women's room uh, back there down the hallway. If you're someone who thinks it's absolutely ridiculous that your bathroom has a gender, I hear you. And there are non-gendered bathrooms that just have toilets that are neither male nor female uh, that are out on the breezeway. Uh, the door should be unlocked. Feel free to, uh, to go in and out as you need to. Uh, let's take a moment now, and I want to invite you to breathe in. And try breathing in better. And try, imagine filling up your your lungs from the bottom to the top. And let's take a moment and give thanks to the air. Let's give thanks for the ability that each of us has to take breath. The air is clean. But for this moment, there is not smoke in it. We breathe in again. <coughs> Remember that the air we breathe is, is sacred. I want to invite you to, if it works for you, to put your feet flat on the floor. And if that doesn't work, just to touch something that's touching the floor. And we remember that with the land that we're on does not belong to Christ Church United Methodist. <coughs> this land belongs to First Peoples. It was unjustly taken from them. permission to be here. And we ask that our work of being in community, of seeking to, to do justice, to live in the ways of compassion, is worthy of our presence here. We remember that the, the ground is sacred. I want to invite you also to become fully aware of the people immediately around you. If it doesn't feel too weird, I want to invite you to look at one or two of them. <laughs> and take a moment and remember that each person is sacred each one of us is made of the same stuff. And we've spent a lot of time arguing about where we came from and where we're going, but chances are it's all from and to the same place. I wanna 
invite us to remember not only the people here that gathered in this room, but also the people who, in my tradition, we say are the great cloud of witnesses, the people who are, are present with us, our foremothers and forefathers, siblings, our family members who have done this work of, of doing justice and living for compassion. I want to just go on on a limb and invite you something from my tradition. Um, we have candles set up over there. If throughout the evening you think of someone of that great cloud of witnesses, uh, great activists or social thinkers or people who inspire you, who have gone before us, uh, I'm gonna invite you to just go and turn on one of the, they're electric, so it's, it's <laughs> I hope you feel as safe as I do. <laughs> I'm gonna invite you to just go and, and turn that on and, and remember that we are, uh, we are following after a, a great many people. And so uh, thank you for being here. This is the most important work that, that any of us can be doing is gathering together uh, and, and doing the work of, of seeking a more just world. And so it's my pleasure to invite Deborah Hammond to come forward and to uh, welcome our speaker. Thank you. So um, thank you, Lindsay. And a big thank you to Christchurch United Methodists for donating this beautiful space for the presentation this evening. Um, and I would also particularly like to thank Jack Wixie, who has helped met with us, taking time to meet with us, and, and helped coordinate the, the space. So, thank you, Jack. Who was that? I would also like to thank our co-sponsors for helping us to get the word out. Um, did a great job. <laughs> I'm really um, pleased to see so many people coming out this evening. Um, uh, and we'll have some time after uh, the talk for you to check out some of the co-sponsors' spaces. Um, I'm, I'm really happy that they all were able to come. Our group, Sonoma Solidarity with Standing Rock, was formed a little over three years ago to support the water protectors in their resistance to the Dakota Access Pipeline. Um, and um, Lindsay was actually very supportive in the beginning providing a space for them to meet, so thank you. Um, initially, our efforts were focused on raising funds to support the camps and educating the local community about the issue. Over time, our focus has shifted to uh, promoting divestment from fossil fuels and finding ways to support the local indigenous community. I first met Nicole, um, a little over a year ago, when we hosted a viewing of a film on the Doctrine of Discovery, which grew out of, some of you are familiar with that, <laughs> imagine, grew out of a series of papal bulls uh, that were issued in the 15th century. The doctrine granted Europeans the right to seize lands and enslave inhabitants of non-Christian territories, and is still influential today. Nicole and her sister Raquel, who are both attorneys, spoke after the film and shared their personal experience as well as their knowledge and insights about the ongoing legal impacts of the doctrine. Their comments were illuminating and profoundly moving. I was particularly struck by their description of their experience as children when their teachers told them there were no Indians left in California. Um, and I was inspired by Nicole's commitment to help indigenous youth learn about their history and reclaim their identity, which I think is a, a, a big part of the purpose of the California Indian Museum and Cultural Center. According to their website, the museum tells the story of California Indians because it is a story that just may untie us from the bonds of racism and hatred and may give the children of California and the world an opportunity to appreciate and respect each other. Beautiful. Um, it's a beautiful facility 
and um, a valuable resource for both the native and non-native communities. And if you haven't uh, been there, it's located just off of Airport Boulevard in Santa Rosa. Uh, several months ago, Jenny Blaker and I met with Nicole to talk about ways we might be able to support her work. And we suggested hosting this benefit. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to have the opportunity to introduce Nicole this evening. I have gained a tremendous admiration for all that she has contributed to our community and to our world. In addition to serving as Executive Director of CIMCC, Nicole is a staff attorney with the National Indian Justice Center, which is also based in Santa Rosa. She conducts cultural competency training for K-12 educators and consults on the elimination of historical bias from California curricula. She also conducts training and curriculum development for several areas of Indian law. And she is the Vice President of the California Association of Museums and formerly co-chaired its Government Relations Committee. In 2010, she founded the Tribal Youth Ambassadors Program, which received the National Arts and Humanities Youth Program Award in 2016. And I've really just skimmed the surface. So, she's amazing. Um, Nicole's presentation will last about an hour, maybe a little bit longer, and then we'll have some time for questions afterwards. If you have not yet had a chance to make a donation to support CIMCC, there are several baskets at the back of the room. Please contribute what you can to support their important work. Um, as a personal thank you, I would like to offer some pears, lemons, and white sage from my garden, from land that once belonged to your ancestors and is now providing me a home. Thank you, Nicole. community organizations and Sonoma County. Um, I often am traveling around and speaking all over but never at home so uh, <laughs> it feels good to have a crowd at home for once. Um, so thank you for coming out and spending your Friday evening with us. Um, I was born and raised in Sonoma County, born over at Memorial, um, raised in Petaluma. My father is Pomo, he's from the Penolaville Indian Reservation up in Mendocino. Uh, we have a lot of family also from the uh, Big Valley Indian Reservation um, in Lakeport. And um, grew up really searching for social justice. Um, my dad created a nonprofit uh, American Indian Lawyer Training Program in 1983. And I'm actually the youngest of eight children. And he went to Bolt Hall at UC Berkeley uh, a couple of years before I was born. And so um, I grew up going to the Cal campus, going to law school, uh, being around Indian attorneys, and um, being told that I was gonna go to law school and that I didn't have a choice anyway. <laughs> so my sister and I are both attorneys. Um, but when I was in law school at USF, and by the way, um, it's nice to see a crowd of um, people that share passion for social justice. Um, I got a degree in peace and conflict studies at UC Berkeley for my undergraduate degree. There were only about 10 peace and conflict studi students at that time, so the department's gotten bigger. Um, and when I went to law school, um, they started creating the museum actually in the Presidio of San Francisco. And when the Presidio was transitioning from a national park um, to a private trust, they thought that it would be fitting to have a native pres presence on the land considering uh, we built the place. <laughs> and so I started working in the museum and had uh, every intent to do public interest law, especially juvenile justice law. 
Um, but I realized something when I started working with kids. I realized something when I went to constitutional law class. I realized that there was a lot of bias in the law, especially constitutional law. And I started thinking, well, maybe it would be better to work on changing the minds of young people in the classroom before they get to the courtroom. And so my passion became social justice as a form of educating about Native American history and culture. And so we've been doing a lot of work at the museum. Um, we really champion our tribal youth ambassadors who are amazing kids and they're working to revitalize their culture and working to be agents of change and addressing uh, bias and racism where they find it. And so uh, it's very inspiring and I feel really lucky to do the work I do. So tonight we're talking about decolonizing and uh, I was joking with my friend, Professor Proudfit, who teaches at San Marcos University on the drive over here. And uh, she said, next year for Halloween, we're gonna be decolonizers. We're gonna have decolonized guns and go around the ray gun decolonizing. So, uh, <laughs> we'll have fun with that. difficulty, I will find it. <laughs> right. So one of the great things about being a museum director is visiting other museums. And I recall uh, being very inspired when the National Museum of the American Indian opened um, in Washington, D.C. in 2002. The director um, is also an Indian lawyer by the name of Richard West, who opened that museum. And we gathered on the mall. There was a procession of 20,000 Native people, and it was very, a very inspiring time to be proud about your Native heritage and to see such a beautiful monument. Um, to Native people, and it's hemispheric. It's, it's not only North, Native North America, but South America. Um, later, I started working with some of the consultants, and it's a, it's a challenging thing to create a national Native American museum because there's so many tribes, right? And in California alone, we have over 200 tribes. So just being the California Indian Museum and Cultural Center is overly ambitious, let alone the National Museum of American Indian. One of the, one of my criticisms of the museum was about its history component and whether or not it confronted historical bias and racism. And they've created a lot of exhibits um, to do just that. Um, but recently I visited the National Museum of African American History. And I found that the National Museum of African American History really did a great job of challenging the false narrative about our history. And so as you go throughout that museum, you find quotes like this. The great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us. We are unconsciously controlled by it. History is literally present in all that we do. And this is really critical because as we address bias, we're often confronted with, oh, that was then, this is now, those were the sins of our grandfathers, how is it relevant, everyone has opportunity. But as a Native American person, we carry historical trauma in our DNA. There's a new science looking at epigenetics and how historical trauma impacts um, cancer and heart disease. And uh, depression and anxiety. And so history is unconsciously carried and it impacts all that we do. Um, and this is not California Indian history, this is California history. And it's uncomfortable. Uh, but it's necessary that we're educated about it, that we share truth and reconciliation. 
The way to right wrongs of the past is to turn the light of truth upon them by the new light. And that really resonated with me. It was great to see those two quotes hang side by side because that is the work that we're doing. Talking about the history, talking about its impact, talking about what we need to change as we move forward. So, one of the false narratives, um, and mind you recently, there was another false narrative around the idea of Native American Heritage Month. I think it was uh, shifted by the White House to Founders Month. Um, yeah, we don't have a lot of, all night to talk about that because I could talk about it all night. <laughs> um, but another false narrative that we often see is that we're a nation of immigrants. And it's interesting because this is something that's reinforced in history and curriculum. Every time you open a third or fourth grade textbook, it often starts with a rendition of the Bering Street theory. And so Vine Deloria, who was a famous Native American attorney, activist, and author, uh, he questioned that, and he challenged the Bering Strait Theory. And he also had a, um, a knack for humor, mm -hmm. um, and I liked how he described it. He said that the Bering Strait Theory is scientific language for I don't know, but it sounds good and no one will chat. <laughs> And he went on to say that an examination of the Bering Strait theory suggests that such a journey would have been nearly impossible, even if there had been hordes of paleo Indians trying to get across a hypothetical land bridge, it appears that not even animals or plants really cross the mythical connection between Asia and North America. My daughter, who was um, who's now a freshman in college, uh, when she was in her middle school classroom, um, I trained her to be an activist from the time she was five. She was out there assaulting her teacher on Columbus Day. And I was very proud, <laughs> verbally assaulting. Um, but she was in her class on Columbus Day and she was um, debating some of the kids about history. And the teacher walked in and in order to quiet the class, um, she said, Jaden, uh, it's all right, we're moving on, be quiet, it doesn't matter, uh, you came from Asia anyway. <laughs> and so, you know, these are assumptions that we have. Now my daughter is half Korean, she has Asian ancestry, but the assumptions that we're making to devalue the arguments of Native people as if we're just another wave of immigration in this country is really what's at the heart of the problem. There are lots of theories about human migration. Not all of them end up published in a textbook. The Bering Strait theory is often presented as fact rather than theory. It's not presented alongside alternative theories, a lot about canoe journeys of people moving from south to north, nor is it presented alongside oral history or cosmology, which connects us as native people to our sacred landscape our traditional places. And so it's important to look at science and debunk it where we can find it and consider alternative scenarios. And one is the Polynesian chicken, who through science they've shown predates the Bering Strait theory. Um, I recently was just at Disneyland and I bought Hey Hey. He's the chicken from Moana. I have a one-year-old um, nephew that loves Hey Hey. And I kind of thought it was funny when I was preparing this uh, presentation. <laughs> he was in love with the Polynesian chicken, so I'm going to give him extra points for that. <laughs> There's a lot of scientific evidence, too, uh, regarding ancestral remains. Now, that would be another lecture where we talk about the study and appropriateness of study of native ancestral remains. But in the recent remains that were studied on um, San Nicolas Island, uh, that story was made famous by Island of the Blue Dolphins. Uh, there were uh, Native people out there on the island, um, mostly a fictional story, but based on a, a uh, real person at the time. 
and the remains in that area are older than 13,000 years old. So we know that the Bering Strait theory is uh, far from fact and potentially fiction. But why do we present this as a narrative? Who gets the credit for the so-called discovery? And I use my air quotes when I don't agree with the terminology. So <laughs> <you see me laughs> <in this. laughs> but when we look at the history books, and I recently had to do um, eighth grade history with my son, so I was reviewing all of the different so-called discoverers right, of North America. Um, who gets the credit? Everyone's searching for credit. Never native people. My kids, I always used to explain to them and made perfect sense to them is like, how could we be discovered? We were already here. <laughs> we weren't looking for to be discovered, right? And so this whole concept of discovery is pretty arrogant um, in the sense that someone needs to take credit uh, for the lives of people who existed since time immemorial. <coughs> So when we talk about the history of California, it does not begin with the Bering Strait. It does not begin with the missions. Um, it begins with the people and the landscape. And we don't put a timeline on it, but we say since time immemorial, meaning since the beginning of time for as long as anyone can remember. And that is something that's very evident in our languages and our oral history and our cosmology and beliefs. This area is a picture of the Six Rivers National Forest. It's an area sacred to many of our tribes up north, the Baruch, the Talwa, the Yurok. And the river in the native language, the word literally translates to the river that runs through the middle of the universe. So thinking about that in terms of native values and belief systems, as opposed to other cultures that went out to seek things separate from their own homes for power, right? But native people drawing that power from their own traditional landscapes. That's a very different way of thinking. And that's very much why we see the clash of cultures and maybe, maybe to some extent, um, you know, the, the lack of preparedness for what was about to happen through the conquest of America. So a lot can be said and not said about traditional California Indian societies. I think it's a little bit like Vine's statement. It's a great language for I don't know and who's gonna check, right? We have oral history. Um, those things are documented through our stories and shared through our families and our communities, but they're not necessarily written down in a book somewhere where someone can fact check. So a lot of things are based on the study and assumptions about our tribal communities. I have a big beef with historians that say that there were only 350,000 California Indians pre-contact. That's the typical number that you will find. However, it was much more likely million California Indians pre-contact. And I'll tell you why that number doesn't make sense when we get to the gold rush. We'll revisit that. But I usually tell kids that come to the museum, why do you live in California? <laughs> well, it's pretty nice, right? Aside from what we were dealing with about a week ago, Usually the weather and the climate's pretty mild and, and it's a place that life can thrive, right? Lots of flora and fauna looked at, you know, by some people who described it as a paradise. Uh, some people who, did, who incorrectly described it as an untamed wilderness. It was not. It was a well cared for garden. You don't get to make beautiful baskets out of plants you just walk by. You have to love them, steward them, pray to them, give to them for them to create those beautiful shoots that create the beautiful baskets that we're so famous for. So California was a place where communities, native people, tribes thrived. 
there was great diversity, right? Today, we look at more than 200 tribes in California still today, right? So we know back then, when things were good, it had to be a lot more. More than, among our Pomo tribes, seven different languages, but much more likely more than 800 languages throughout the state. So diversity, uh, people lived in small groups, people stewarded the land, they worked together. Um, were there territories? Yes, we had specific territories. Sometimes those were shared territories. Doesn't mean that no one ever fought over territory, but usually no one died over territory. So as the so-called discovery comes along, we're looking at apocalyptic Christianity. And I went to Catholic school, so if I feel like I'm gonna get struck down, <laughs> I'm recovering still from the Catholic school experience. So if I duck a couple times. Um, I have given a presentation to priests and nuns on accurate mission history, so I did survive, so. <laughs> but looking at the history and the themes behind apocalyptic Christianity, um, there was a sense of going out and spreading the word, right? And going out and instituting Christianity in places that were traditionally non-Christian. And so, you know, we have the Crusades, right? We had the Catholic Church calling for waging war on non-Christian societies throughout the world. And the way that that was developed is through this idea of the doctrine of dis extinguishment, which later becomes the doctrine of discovery. And mind you, the doctrine of discovery is still good law in 2019. Uh, we can rely on it, we can cite it. It supports the tribal trust land structure um, that's built in the U.S. today. We'll talk more about that. But under this principle, extinguishment seeks to extinguish first people, people who are non-Christian. And where they're not extinguishing people, they're extinguishing languages, custom, tradition, ideology. Um, and doing it in a way that facilitates the taking of land. So in 1095, the first uh, papal bull terris nullis, which translates to vacant land, is created that gives kings the right to discover land that is not inhabited by Christian people. Law basically facilitates the taking of land from indigenous people all over the world. And when we start breaking it down, we look at the language. Here we see our apostolic authority, full and free, permission to invade, search out, capture, subjugate the Saracens and the pagans, and the other unbelievers and enemies of Christ, right? and reduce their persons into perpetual slavery. And so this becomes the system, the system for the taking and the system to subjugate, if not just eradicate the people. And this is the foundation that we stand on, right? And when we talk about people living in privilege, we are privileged because we stand on this foundation and we stand on the backs of other people who are subjected to it. So this is genocide. Uh, this is God-ordained genocide, uh, legally sanctioned by the church and by other foreign powers genocide. And they perpetuate it through a couple of different ways. I always thought this was interesting, the Valdolid controversy, controversy in 1550. So they weren't quite sure what they were doing was actually right, right? <laughs> At least they questioned it. 
And so they decided to have a meeting with three priests and a philosopher over a few day period to determine if indigenous people had souls. At the end of the meeting, they decided that indigenous people did have souls. Um, so that was a relief. However, they said that typically the people who went out to colonize didn't really respect the fact that we have souls. But think about it in terms of this. This is where we get the mission system. Because if we didn't have souls, fine, wipe them out, right? We see a lot of indigenous communities that are just completely annihilated to the extent that they can be. Um, but under a mission system, if an Indian has a soul, then there's some value. Not value as someone who's equal to other Christians because you are not a, a Christian, you're a neophyte, right? New to Christianity, but value in terms of labor and creating revenue and support for the system of the church. There's a lot of question too, and some arguments among historians about whether or not a genocide occurred in the Americas. I find it funny that there's an argument about that. <laughs> I would like to read the definition. I'm pretty sure it's clear. Uh, any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part national, ethnical, racial, or religious group killing of members, causing serious bodily in injury or mental harm to a group, inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. That's pretty clear to me that that happened. However, there are some historians who argue that genocide couldn't have occurred in the Americas because the majority of death was caused by disease. Well. I don't know about unintentional or intentional. I do know that the first disease that ran rampant across the state of California was syphilis. And that was because Native women were raped by Spanish soldiers as they went through the mission trail. And it was spread quite rampantly. So that to me definitely fits within the definition of intentional infliction of bodily harm. When we look at the different stages of genocide, we can easily see the correlations between California Indian history and genocide. And these are the typical eight stages that they evaluate for genocide that happens all over the world. Classification to distinguish people, us versus them. Symbolization, group markings, they often talked about people in terms of them being civilized or uncivilized. Dehumanization, looking at naming groups. If early newspaper accounts in California, men are referred to as bucks and women are referred to as squaws. Organizations, special military units. We have a whole history of California militia expeditions that went out and hunted unruly Indians. I'll tell you that those were any Indians, not just unruly Indians that were hunted at the time. Polarization, dividing the group through intermarriage, social interaction, propaganda. We had an act for the government and protection of California Indians. Sounds like it's something good. It was the indentured servitude of California Indians. We'll talk about Preparation, victims being identified and segregated. We have boarding schools that happened here in the United States and elsewhere. Reservation systems are essentially the effort to segregate. We have extermination, the all out killing of native people. The first governor, the state of California, waged a war of extermination on native people in his opening speech. It was interesting. I always have these fun side notes from my daughter's experiences. But when she was in her high school history class, her teacher knew she was Native American. She obviously was very outspoken about it. 
and he was excited during the Native American history section because he, all the, all the members in the class were gonna present on a massacre. And when she came into class, he said, oh, we're all gonna pick our massacres out of the hat, and um, I put some aside for you. And she looked in there, and he had, you know, um, uh, the Custer's Last Stand, you know, things like that, Sand Creek, things like that. And she said, you know, I prefer to do something from California. And he said, oh no, I, I'm thinking like a big massacre. I want you to present on a big massacre. And so you know, she had fun with that. And she said, the war of extermination was not a big massacre. And she went and gave him the book on California genocide. So he got educated. <laughs> but the last stage is the one that I like to draw attention to the fact that we're still in this stage. And that is denial and that is blaming the victim. And as we continue to not recognize the truth of history, we perpetuate the cycle of genocide. And so we really have to think about how we're going to break that cycle at the denial phase of genocide. So when I look at early texts, and we always have a hard time sifting through early texts about California history, um, it's very difficult to digest the way they write about Native people. There are two tenets of doctrine of discovery. One is that in order to take the land, the Native people have to be deemed uncivilized. And the second is that the, the land has to be uncultivated. And if those two factors are present, then the land is for the taking by the English, French, Spanish crown. So when you go back to history, and, it, and Native people are written about by explorers, they often write for the purpose of justifying that the people are uncivilized and that the land was uncultivated. That's how we got the whole idea that it was an untamed wilderness when it was not. Um, this text, get closer to read it, is one of the first history books of California in the late 1800s. And it says that the Indians of California were the farthest fallen below the average Indian type. They were neither brave nor bold nor generous nor spirited. They seemed to have possessed none of the noble characteristics that the slight coloring of romance make heroes of the red men of the Atlantic slopes and win for them our ready sympathy. We hear of no orators among them, no bold braves terribly resenting and contesting to the last usurpation of the whites. They were diggers, filthy and cowardly, succumbing without a blow to the rule of foreign masters. Venegas thought that the lower Californians were the most stupid and weak in both body and mind of all mortals. Oh, that's the foundation of our history. That's what other researchers go to, right? When you gotta find the primary <coughs> sources um, to write about our people. So, when we're reading history and conducting analysis, we really have to consider the source and what the purpose was behind the source, who it was written for and why. And when we seek, seek sources from people who came and were so-called discoverers, these, this is the type of information that they provide. So we're gonna start first with talking about the missions and then we'll talk about the gold rush. These are some colonized versions of mis mission history that I often find. Um, our history began in California with the missions. It's often the first thing that's written about in the history of California. Um, they write that we were docile, that we happily accepted mission life, that we wandered over or joined the missions. I always use the example, you might join 24-hour fitness, 
<laughs> you might go in, check out the locker room. The pool's nice, I think I'll sign up. That wasn't the situation <laughs> with the missions. The California Indians were uncivilized. Uncivilized according to who, right? To the narrative that wanted to seek to take away our land, uncivilized, but we were perfectly civilized in our own Yahi or Pomo or Yurok context. That Indians were fascinated by the missions and the soldiers. There are a lot of loaded words in the mission history text. Fascinated? No, I was fascinated when I saw Jason Momoa, okay? <laughs> Aquaman, he was pretty fascinating. My husband did not appreciate it, but he was fascinated. We're not fascinated by the missionaries or the soldiers that would, that creates romanticism around that. Or that we wandered. We don't wander somewhere where we lived since time immemorial, right? We might have came over to check out what was going on. And, you know, history kind of starts when the missions were created, but people came repeatedly for many, many years prior to that, setting up the opportunity to stay. But of course, Native people were interested in what those people were doing or what their plans were. Fascination, wandering, not part of it. This is a song that was sang in the Fresno Unified School District. I haven't heard about it in Sonoma County, and I'm thankful for it. But if you read it, it says, the mission stand made of earth, brick, massive walls, three feet thick, arms stretched out, a padre sea, saying, come little Indian, dance with me. In a golden land, there the missions rest to save the soul, soothe the savage breast. A song of hope to set you free. Come, little Indian, dance with me. And I surround this by pictures of Native youth for a reason. You know, this is very one-dimensional. Obviously, it presents a false narrative, romanticizing uh, the spread of Christianity. Doesn't say too much about what happened to the Native people. But if you could think of one of these Native children being forced to sing that song, and then think about what happened when they went home and told their mom, right? Mom's hair goes on fire. She marches down into the classroom. She's mad. She's not just mad, she's triggered, right? Because she remembers when that happened when she was in fourth grade, and you don't poke the mama bear, okay? That was me. It was mom bear with the hair on fire. But I was also triggered through my own historical trauma. So when I get there, my face is red, I feel a pit in my stomach, and I'm yelling at the teacher, who probably just didn't know better, probably was just using what was in the file and wasn't thinking about it. And I'm having a hard time communicating to him or her why it's wrong. What the result is going to be and the impact is going to be on my child, right? And all they're seeing is an angry face with someone's hair on fire. So it creates that lack of understanding and that miscommunication that gets perpetuated every time something like this happens. So it's very unfortunate. And I surround it too with really pictures of Native youth you know, practicing a very vibrant culture, a culture that is alive and resilient, and it's not stuck in 1764. It's changing and dynamic, and people have to recognize that despite all of this history, that the resiliency in Native communities to not just survive what happened, but be able to thrive in 2019 is the ultimate act resistance. So the Spanish came and they claimed that they created roads and trails, but they were really our trails that we already were using for a long time. And they established 23 missions. They usually don't talk about the 22nd and the 23rd because Indians kept burning them down. 
and they weren't able to rebuild them, so they kind of just left. You know, what do they say? Uh, only be, only teach history where you're optimistic about, you know, you don't want to highlight the failures, so they leave the 22nd and 23rd out. They were searching for populations of native people, the highest concentrated populations north of Mexico City. And there was no agreements, there was no consultation in pursuing that creation. Recently we visited um, San Antonio, Texas, and they have quite a few missions in their area. And we were comparing um, notes on our mission history with the native um, presenters who were there. And we asked, you know, to, to us, our mission history is very much about genocide. Do you feel that way? And they said, no, it depends who you ask. Um, some of us feel that the mission saved us, that there were other tribes, um, that we became in danger, and the missions were a place we flocked to for safety. And I thought that was an interesting narrative. I, I would like to deconstruct that narrative because I think that that narrative, uh, we were looking about 30 or 40 years before California. So I wonder how much influence um, the church had on that narrative, but, um, but I'd like to know more. So the strategy was to create missions in the population centers. So the, the concentration of missions we see, there were seven missions in Ohlone territory and five missions in Chumash territory. And the Bay Area had that largest population of native people in North of Mexico City. Religious pretensions aside, they were places to enslave native people. It wasn't like you could join and leave. You had to stay. You got locked in at night, right? In the separate quarters. And the mission governance prohibited native people from practicing their traditions. Native people were very savvy and they realized that if they were within the mission, that they could present things, gifts, and different things to the Padre that would be brought out during celebration. So the Ohlone look at their native ceremonies following the, the calendar of the Catholic Church and in certain times being able to bring out. So when we talk about resistance, which I don't really like the term resistance either because I feel like it's a defense of homeland, really, not necessarily resistance. But there were different types of resistance. There was definite physical resistance, but there was also the resistance in saving culture and community and language and art. And when you start to kind of peel back the layers of the mission, you find that Native people left their footprint within those missions uh, for their ancestors to draw upon at a later time, and that's very beautiful. So, according to the Spanish, the missions were royal governmental institutions. The native people that they encountered, so-called encountered, were to be converted to Christianity, and they were going to create an economy based on agriculture. This created a few problems. Typical lifespan in the mission for people was about 10 years. It was very common that because they changed their diet, probably from acorn to sweet corn, that everybody's teeth would fall out. Um, they became very sick and very unhealthy, not to mention the living environment. There were many missions where all the kids under 12 years old died. Um, a lot of influenza outbreaks that took entire populations. Father Sarah, he was very centered around the idea that he wanted to be the first person to bring Christianity to an untouched native population. And 
that's part of the foundation upon which he got his sainthood, right? And so in that focus, he instituted certain policies that were very detrimental to Native people. Father Sarah grew up on the island of Majorca in Spain, was a cattle farming community, and when he saw that the Native children typically did not thrive, typically got sick, um, at a very young age, he instituted a mission-wide policy that they all be put on cow's milk rather than mother's milk. And a lot of Native people are lactose intolerant, so that was a downfall for many of the children in the mission. There is also a discrepancy in the narrative about animals. So the, the missions brought with them a lot of stock animals. Um, they ate really well. Uh, they had really good native indigenous food <laughs> and they thrived upon it. I was recently, side note, uh, working with a, a woman who does research on the black bears. The black bears are coming back to Sonoma County. And we were talking about the food that the bears eat versus our indigenous food and how similar they are. And um, she was talking about when grizzly bears were in California that we really had the largest grizzly bears um, because they had really good food, right? Acorn, high in protein, also elephant seals. They ate the elephant seals and became giant, which is pretty cool. And different narratives around the impact of those farm animals on California. Here's one from a textbook called O California. They, the Indians, had never seen animals like the cattle and sheep that wandered around the mission. There's that word again. The Indians accepted the new kinds of food and clothing the priests and padres offered them. Many Indians joined the mission. Boy, that's just a loaded one. <laughs> Here's a, a version from um, Sarah Suppahan's A Legacy of Genocide. Those missionaries, the priests and the soldiers, they had all kinds of animals they brought here, different kinds of animals. They turned these animals loose on our land. We had lots of stuff we planted and harvested through the year. The animals started taking out all of the good food we had. We lost a lot of things, they just pulled it out by the roots. So destroying that well cared for garden, right? Um, and shifting the diet to something that wasn't no longer nutritious or healthy. There was slow growth in the missions. Um, it was so slow, right? They had to report back that they were successful by showing how many baptisms had occurred, that the mission records show that they often baptized one Indian four or five times. So that they could write back and say they were being successful. Right? They were intended to be these self-sufficient com communities, and the missions in California ultimately failed in terms of the mission policy and what they did to people. There's an interesting story from Mission San Jose that I think really illustrates that resistance, that beauty um, of Native people accommodating and adapting and preserving their culture. So the Padres, often when you look at mission records, the mission will move several times, and that's usually because when the Padres arrived, the native people moved away. And so they tried to keep moving the church closer, or the church might have got burned down. Um, and so one of the strategies at Mission San Jose was that the Padres decided, because they have this one year where they see this surge in baptism there, the Padres decided, wouldn't it be clever, if we made the village cemetery a Catholic cemetery. And in order to be buried in the Catholic cemetery, you have to be Catholic. So now the Native people looking at the village cemetery, seeing their loved ones, have to submit to baptism if they want to lie and rest there. That's pretty clever. Uh, but the Native people were also clever. And so there was a back door at the mission and a creek that ran 
back behind it. And so they stationed their um, native healer, uh, spiritual person at the creek. And as soon as they got the baptism from the front door, they went out the back door and she did a ceremony to wash off the baptism. <laughs> I like that story. <laughs> The lifestyles were devastated, mission population slowly increased. There was a large loss of numbers, native people from their communities. Native people were captured, they were lured to the missions. There's a lot of stories of abuse and harsh conditions. I read, it. there's not a lot of accounts of first person accounts of native people. There's one Pablo talk who was from the San Luis Rey Mission. He was about 17 years old and he was taken back to Rome. And he did many writings, uh, but all of those writings were interpreted by the priests. So you have to wonder, you know, what the writings really represent. There were some stories that I read about not only physical abuse, but mental abuse. One story concerning Father Lassavin was about a young woman who was fighting with another young woman at the mission. And it turns out they were fighting over a, a man. One woman was married to him, the other one it was her boyfriend. And the woman who was married couldn't have children. And so Father Lassavin inserted himself in the middle of the argument and he pulled the married woman into his chambers and did a physical exam on her to determine if she could have children or not. During which she bit him. And he was bleeding. And he was angry. And so his punishment to the man and the woman, the married couple, was that the man had to wear a set of steer horns everywhere that he went for several weeks. And the woman had to carry a wooden doll. So you think about that. Not only the physical abuse, but the mental abuse. The, the, the shaming of the woman who could not bear children. Right? And dehumanizing the man to an animal. And you have to you know, think about the consequences of that. The long-term impacts of that. Not just within native communities, but over generations. I always like to say, if you look at the boarding schools, think about generations of kids that were removed from their parents, from nurturing, loving, right, cultural, uh, supportive environments, and then wonder what kinds of parents they became. Yeah. Families were separated, long working hours, uh, Incidences of people being flogged or setting dogs to attack people. Rape was common. People were not allowed to go home. Worked 30 to 40 hours a week. Produced tools that could be sold or traded to support the missions. These are some excerpts from that Sarah Suffahan book. Um, I had a great uncle. His father came back, they escaped, but they never could keep the mountain people in the mission because they always managed to escape. They wouldn't plow for them. They wouldn't do any of the work at the mission. But when he came home, he came home with a collar around his neck. The collar was made of wood. It had little steel hooks on it. This one is, is a very sad story and it, it tells you about the so-called joining of the missions. Uh, the Kumeyaay story of Crying Rock. There were a lot of things that were done to people. One way they had was to get them through their children. They would take the children up to the cliff and drop them down the cliff and kill them, essentially until all the adults agreed to go to the mission. So, if you weren't joining, there was no choice in the matter, right? So, when do we teach this? Fourth grade? How many teachers are going to want to tell their kids about this, right? Go home and give them nightmares. Parents are going to be calling with questions. So we keep the denial, right? We blame the victim. 
Because when the kid raises their hand and says, that's not the version of history I know, they say, sit down, Gabe, be quiet. We know a real Indian that lives on the reservation. That's what one teacher said to a, a lonely kid. Or the kid that speaks up all the time and the other students say, oh, you're just being sensitive. You just want to be politically correct. Right? Or, really, you're an Indian? I didn't know there were any Indians left in California. You don't look like an Indian. Right? So now that person has to prove that they're Indian rather than talk about the substance of the issue. Indians were flogged for practicing their own customs. Armed soldiers stood by at masses. Soldiers abused them. And they revolted. Many tribes revolted. Uh, the first mission that was built in San Diego, they burned the mission down several times. When you walk through that mission today, that picture is, is hung about four or five places. And it illustrates Indians attacking the priest. However, if you go to the Spanish mission record, this incident that's illustrated in this, in this painting, the record doesn't indicate that the mission, yes, the Indians surrounded the mission. They wanted to burn it down. The father was on the stairs, and he ran out, and he said, the arrows were already flying. But he wasn't surrounded and brained with a rock. So it's interesting the narrative that's created, right? About the savage, about the uncivilized, about we're just trying to bring Christianity in and that the other side is completely innocent in the situation, not throwing babies over the cliff. When we get to the gold rush, which we also do in the fourth grade, we don't talk about Indians. Because we don't talk about them after the missions. It's like they just kind of silently went away. The gold rush is the most significant time of genocide in our history. Okay? The missions, there was genocide. And if you ask a historian, they'll tell you, well, there are about 350,000 California Indians pre-contact, about 150,000 of them perished during the mission system, mostly due to disease, and then another 100,000 died during the gold rush. Well, the gold rush was a much shorter period, right? 10, 15 years. It was a very violent period. It was the most dangerous time to be a California Indian and you were lucky if you survived it. This is my great-great-grandmother, Elizabeth Posh. She was from the Big Valley Indian Reservation, Clear Lake. And she didn't speak much English. Mostly spoke Quetzal, which is our Eastern Pomo language. And when my dad was a little boy, she tell him the story of the Bloody Island Massacre. The Bloody Island Massacre happened in Clear Lake, and it was in response to Stone and Kelsey, who were two ranchers. There's a town named Kelseyville, named after Mr. Kelsey. The ranchers at that time typically gathered up native people and kept them as slaves. They gathered up about 100 Pomo men at the time and sent them to the mines, and only three returned. It wasn't that they all escaped. They typically didn't feed or give water to Indians in mines. They treated them as disposable labor. Women, on the other hand, were taken into the house and become domestic workers, but they were also taken very young and held as concubines. Stone and Kelsey had several girls that they kept in their house. And when the men didn't come back and the community knew what was happening to the girls, they decided to respond 
And so they told the girls at night to put the men's guns in buckets of water and that they would come through the windows and that they would kill Stone and Kelsey and have them escape. They did that. Stone and Kelsey were killed by the, by the group of Pomos and the girls were taken and the group basically went on the run because they knew the cavalry was coming next. When the cavalry came, we're not even sure if they actually found the, gr the group that killed Stone and Kelsey, but they committed massacres among Pomo groups that they could find. And the campaign lasted for about a month. And Bloody Island was a fishing community, and it's up in Clear Lake, and there were hundreds of people at the island, and the mothers taught the, the young people that if you, if the soldiers come, hide under the water and breathe through the tule reeds, and that's how you survive. The soldiers came, and they attacked the men, women, and children. The history books say that somewhere between 10 and 800 people died at Bloody Island. There was a mass grave that everyone was put into. We don't have an actual number. Uh, somewhere between 10 and 800 is a wide range. Um, my grandmother's story is about uh, our family's survival by her mother hiding under her mother's dead body. And that's just one of many Pomo family stories. And that's just one of many massacres. Our native youth group actually did a map, uh, taking Ben Madley's American Genocide book and mapping the massacres in California. And so you can see that there's well over 300 massacres in those red dots. And this is where they occurred all over the state of California. And this was all during the gold rush. So there was a time in California in our history where native people were on the run to survive. It's hard to say where we're all from. You know, I've tracked my great grandfather who was very much accepted as a Pomo and lived in Ukiah his whole life they even had the nickname Chief Ukiah on his baseball jersey. Um, but I think he probably actually came from the Oroville area and was probably born there. So thinking about our history and thinking about our Native people being on the run for survival, it was a critical time. <laughs> During the gold rush, this gives you an example of pre-gold rush versus post-gold rush economic structures. And that pre-gold rush, there were a few landholders and who controlled Indian workers who tended the mines. The Indians outnumbered non-natives 10 to 1. By 1850, whites outnumbered Indians 2 to 1. There was an influx of people, but a lot of people were being massacred. Post-gold rush economy, Indians knew about gold. It wasn't discovered. We knew it was there. It wasn't valuable to us. It was a soft metal. It wasn't good for much. Uh, but when they did value it during the gold rush, the, the trading post actually had what they called a digger slug. And that was a lead weight that they put on when Indians came in to trade for gold so that we had to pay much more in gold than uh, the typical gold miner came in. Sutter's Fort, that's where gold was so-called discovered. It was so-called discovered by a Nissanin uh, person who worked at the fort. But the fort was also in land that was actually promised to our native people in our treaties that were not ratified. It's estimated that 23.3 million ounces of gold was dug up in California during the gold rush. More than 100 tons of mercury was dug up for use in the gold rush. 
right? The sluice mining, just washing away the hillsides. Um, we really like to point out, you know, that the respect for the earth and the respect for indigenous people go hand in hand. And when we look at our history and see the exploitation of native people, we see the exploitation of our environment. During the gold rush, there was forced or manipulated mining labor, forced to pay off for food, for gear. 10,000 Indians were indentured. Girls were sold for $200, boys were sold for 60. I tell that to my fourth graders that come in and I always feel bad because the girls get competitive and they, they're excited. They're like, yeah, we're worth more than boys. Um, and I have to tell them why. <laughs> You know, we're talking about human trafficking. Um, it's very, very much a sad history, but I didn't choose for it to be in the fourth grade. I just refused to lie about it. Indians constituted more than half the miners in many of the mines. Indian women worked in the mines. And forced prostitution ran rapid. The governor waged a war of extermination saying that Indian people were basically varmints, should be exterminated, and that the war of extermination would be waged and continue until the Indian race becomes extinct, must be expected. We cannot anticipate the result, but with painful regret and inevitable destiny of a race that is beyond the power of wisdom of man to A few months ago, the governor of California today was the first governor ever to use the term genocide and create an apology to the native people of California. Long time coming. Another thing that's very important to understand the history of California is to understand the structure of Indian land holdings. I know that gaming is very controversial in California. A lot of people don't want it in what they think is their backyard. Um, I remember when Arnold was the governor and one of his platforms was that California Indians didn't pay their fair share, uh, which he meant we should pay more of our casino revenues to the state of California. We paid our fair share in blood and land uh, many times over, but with an uninformed public, you can create a platform like that and have people believe it. There were 18 treaties that were signed in the state of California. They would have constituted seven and a half million acres of land. Today, collectively, when we have 109 federally recognized tribes, collectively they hold less than 500,000 acres. So think about how different California would be had our treaties been honored. Why weren't our treaties honored? Well, in order for a treaty to become law, it has to be sent back to DC and be ratified. By the time it was sent back, the telegrams were going all the way back to DC, don't ratify, the land has gold on it. And so what did they do? They put the treaties under an injunction of secrecy and they didn't tell the native people who signed the treaties that they weren't gonna get the land and they didn't tell anyone else. They hid it for 50 years. And so what happened during that time? Well, homesteading. Oh, here's vacant land, go down to the courthouse, fill out some papers, it's yours. So as Indians left their lands and tended to move to treaty lands, they lost their homelands. As they moved to the treaty lands, they got turned away. So we have five decades of landless Indians in California. Landless and on the run for survival. Think about the legacy of that. In 1905, some small federal funds were put aside to start buying land tracts back for Native people. They were usually on areas where Native people were living, not necessarily in areas where Native people were related to one another. And so when you see 
a hundred different little lands being bought up to support native people, they're going to be in people's backyards, <laughs> right? So hence we have casinos. If you only have one or four acres and you have a thousand members, y'all can't live on that land. Y'all can't do economic development that requires cultural or natural resource extraction, right? You're limited. Casino's a pretty good option, right? To support people, to gain economic power, to put your people back to work, to send your kids to school, to provide health care, to support your government. This is a map of the 18 treaties. Those are the lands that would have been set aside as treaty lands had the treaties been honored and ratified. The Act for the Government and Protection of Indian Children was essentially indentured servitude after slavery was outlawed. It facilitated a slave trade for California Indian youth in conjunction with what was called the Militia Expeditions. 1851 to 59, the state government paid over a million dollars, it'd probably be worth about 25, it'd probably be about $25 million today, to say, hey, here's 25 million, go hunt Indians, we'll reimburse you for supplies. So they basically called on private, groups of citizens to go out and hunt unruly Indians. They found a box of receipts in the late 90s in the basement of the state capitol showing all of the payouts that were conducted. They paid anywhere from 50 cents to $5 per scalp, a native person. So do the math. If we only thought there were about 350,000 Indians pre-contact, and the government's paying $5 at a high rate, and we put it into a million dollars, or a million and a half, there's a lot more than 350,000 people dying just during the gold rush, let alone pre-mission system. Nobody wants to argue with me after I say that. If there's any historians, find me later, we'll debate. So we find ourselves looking for a balanced perspective about our history. And oftentimes I go out and I teach park docents, or I teach nuns and priests, or I teach teachers about history. And occasionally I'll get someone that comes up and says, that's your story. You and your revisionist history. And I always think it's funny because I'm not revising anything. <laughs> I'm just asking, asking for acknowledgement. Um, there's also a narrative out there that there was blood on both hands. That sure, the colonizers did a lot of bad things, but the native people weren't innocent. And that somehow that creates some kind of inequality in the balanced relationship of history. And that's not true. Um, sure, there weren't always innocent people out there. There were plenty of Native people who worked on behalf of coloners, but it doesn't provide a justification or an excuse for genocide. As we continue to try to justify it and excuse it, we allow it to perpetuate, not just here on our own homelands, but all over the world. So we have to teach our children we have to find common ground. We may not agree on all the facts, but through discussion and sharing and acceptance and acknowledgement, we can make sure that our kids don't repeat these mistakes. I wanna thank you for coming tonight. I'm happy to stay and ask questions. I know it got late and it got long, but I wanna thank you for hanging in there. And I really don't wanna leave you on a sad note. Um, our culture and our communities are beautiful and thriving. And the fact that we were able to 
experience this history but be here today <laughs> and live in a time where we can bring out our culture and share it with people and celebrate it is a wonderful thing. And so we have that hope for the future and for our kids and we appreciate you being here and learning and understanding, so thank you. subject or are you planning to? I've written a few chapters. I haven't had time to dedicate to a whole book, um, but I do have a book that I co-authored with my colleague, uh, Professor Proudfit, on Indian education in California. And I didn't give my grandma credit, but one of the reasons that my dad's a lawyer and that we've got uh, almost five lawyers in the family now is that my grandmother our tribe was terminated in the 1950s under federal law that sought to basically just get rid of Indian tribes because they felt it was too expensive. Um, they ended our tribal sovereign status. And my grandmother was the named plaintiff on a class action lawsuit that went to the Supreme Court that restored our tribe and 16 other tribes. So, um, yeah. so I just wrote a chapter uh, for a book that'll be coming out about her life and her work as an Indian activist. Yeah. What, what age do you think would be, I mean, how would you want to, and how do you work at integrating into Indian history into curriculum? I think it, so I think definitely for our history, I think it should be a high school level class. Although I think there are other things that we can teach kids. Um, we have some maker stations at the museum where we teach about any Indian innovations in science and traditional ecological knowledge. And so I think that there's lots of lessons where we can honor Indian culture and innovation through academic lessons. But, you know, for a, a factual discussion of history, I do think, um, you know, I don't know, kids are pretty sophisticated. I, I've met some fourth grade classes that knew all the facts and they were fine, but I do think a high school level um, would be a better, better, more appropriate grade. So assigned reading for my daughter's fourth grade class was um, Island of the Blue Dolphins this year, and I'm wondering if you know of any books that you would recommend for children of that age that are better? Yes. Or um, that are being written right now? There is a Native professor who, oh, I, will, I hope her, her name will come to me. Um, she actually puts out reading lists. So she, um, she got the Laura Ingalls Wilder Award changed uh, because she felt the Laura Ingalls Wilder books really didn't honor Native people. And so she put, she um, she supports Indian authors and puts out reading lists for different age ranges. And um, her name is in my Twitter feed, so I can definitely look it up and give it to you. Oh, it came to me. Dr. Debbie Reese. Hi, Nicole. Thank you so much for your talk tonight. Um, I just saw a documentary on truth and reconciliation work that was done in the, I think, Alondaga, up in the East Coast. Do you want, or up in Maine, do you want to see a truth and reconciliation commission in Sonoma County? I do.
do. I know that the governor has put together a truth, or is putting together a truth and reconciliation committee for California Indians, but I do think it would be important to have one that's local. I know that um, there's a lot of towns out there that are looking to honor Native people, and um, I would really like to see Native people, you know, more engaged in local city and county leadership, that we're having a voice on uh, stewardship of lands, that we're, you know, we live in wine country and we're trying to revitalize our traditional foods right now. Well, you know, everything's grapes and privatized. And so, you know, we often have to go out and gather in, in public parks. And, and we appreciate all of the folks out there who are um, standing up for the plants but as we're gathering, we often have to stop to justify people who want to know what we're doing with the plants. So, um, you know, it's very hard to try to revitalize those traditions um, in a climate where people just don't know a lot about us or what we're doing. And so it would be nice to have something that raises that visibility and awareness and education. I would like to see that. Hi, I'm curious to get your perspective on holidays, like the coming Thanksgiving, and what you imagine for us um, in this context to kind of, I don't know, yeah, like transform those holidays, or I just want to hear what you have to say about like creating something else, or I don't know, yeah, I guess what you have to say about that. I would research more about um Native people and, and the real facts around those holidays, you know, and especially around Thanksgiving, if you start to learn about um, the sashams from the tribes that were near that area where the Mayflower landed, they always practiced a celebration of harvest season, but that was usually among their traditions, a time for redistribution of wealth. So the community would come together and then redistribute wealth. So it became a time of giving. So in terms of those themes, you know, they very much um, illustrate native values and value systems, but they're really just cloaked in this whole romanticized garbage narrative of what actually happened. Um, so I'd like to see more light shed on that truth and also maybe more celebration and appreciation of the native values for around the harvest season and, and celebrating and sharing with community members. So we don't, we celebrate Thanksgiving, we all wear black to the table. Um, but you know, coming together as a family and eating and sharing, um, that's something as native people uh, we love to do. We don't, you know, put on pilgrim and feather caps or anything like that. We hate it when you put those on our kids. Um, but, you know, we appreciate the holiday just maybe for other reasons. What was the redistribution of wealth? Hello. Hi. I, my family and I are here, and uh, I personally would like to thank you so very much for you coming here and to sharing the story that is so much needed to be heard. And we are better human beings in the community as we reach out to listen to your voice and what you have learned and what you are educating children and adults. And I thank all of you people for coming. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate it. You don't know how much that is good for the heart. It's good for the heart of us as human beings. It's good for my heart as an Indian person who has been hit, hurt by many of these histories. Thank Not you. Just in the contemporary time, but for all our ancestors. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our 
greatest success story, although it's bittersweet. Um, we worked uh, very much with San Francisco Unified last year. Um, we were contracted to train their teachers, and we were also contracted to work with their um, Native Youth Education Program. And I think that uh, they put invest a lot of money into Indian education, and uh, even, um, I don't know how far along, but they're investing several million dollars in eliminating bias from their history textbooks. So I see them as really kind of leading the charge. Um, although if you were watching the news or reading the news, you heard about the Washington mural, Washington High School mural. Uh, we also facilitated community meetings around that mural and worked on uh, educating community members about it. And it was unfortunate about the media campaign um, that really kind of attacked Native people in the community. We actually were collecting, we got a lot of hate mail. Uh, we thought about taking all the hate mail and creating an exhibit with it. Um, but people were very emboldened um, about the idea that we thought they thought we were trying to erase history. And it's like, how can we erase it when we haven't even got it on the board? <laughs> and that's really, you know, what they were missing. And so um, if you haven't had the opportunity right now in San Francisco is the continuous thread exhibit. And uh, we have a California native um, who's on the San Francisco Arts Commission. And she worked with native people in the Bay Area to create an exhibit uh, showcasing Native people in San Francisco. And so uh, last year they took out, out the Pioneer statue that was downtown at the Civic Center. And so the continuous thread exhibit showcases Native people, activists, families standing on the Pioneer statue and reclaiming Native space. And it's just really breathtaking. So um, I, yeah, San Francisco's doing the best job that I can see right now. San Diego Unified also has a Native American superintendent, and they've been doing a lot of good work with their uh, training of their teachers as well. Wow. Uh, hello, um, I'm a little nervous, uh, and I okay. had a chicken scratch question. It's about <laughs> like a two page question, but and I hope it's within the scope of what you're talking about today, but I'm asking as an individual and a librarian, um, if we have an educational space, the library, and I have a series called Planet People Project, and it's about building resilient communities and ecosystems. And so I've been interested in you know, spreading ideas around ecological re rehabilitation, um, meaning how we develop practices um, as humans in terms of survival and subsistence that are regenerative and healthy and connected to nature. And I do believe that our industrialized society is broken. And sometimes I feel like the only thing I can do as an individual is to study the pandemic human lifestyles of early peoples um, while at the same time I'm afraid of um, romanticizing other people's cultures. Um, but I would like to be part of recreating a society built on healthy relationships to nature. And sometimes it seems like the only options are looking at the anthropological record, which is colonizers, or asking current Native peoples to teach the colonizers the skills and knowledge that they may have still kept alive. And I recognize this dilemma, and but I also feel that it's really important that we revive this knowledge and spread it. And so I'm wondering how you feel about um, what we can, what I can do as a white person wanting to look into all of that and rebuild that in, in, um, with, without doing appropriation. You know, that's my main question. Um, yeah, that's, if complicated, um, it's very hard, you know, we work with some organizations and, and there, you know, there is a sense of looking to native culture and knowledge for answers, but understanding that they might not fit the context <laughs> of, you know, other communities. And so, really respecting the knowledge space. 
They just didn't feel that that's where it should be. And now, because we started losing a lot of our elders, it also became a necessity to have it in a digital space. So understanding that na Native communities are dynamic and changing, and that what might not work one year may change the next year, and that's really up to that community to define and drive. And understanding that people aren't entitled to know everything. You know, there are certain things that under our protocols are just for our people. Um, there are certain things that are only done in a certain time and place. And if that's the case, you know, knowing when to respect it and, and step aside. But what I really find a problem with, and I face it everywhere in academia and different places, is there's a usurpation of native authority, you know. In academia, the anthropologists are the experts. When I go to the museum collection, it's all about the person who collected the baskets and not the person who made the baskets. You know, the historian who argues with me and tells me it was 350,000 and not a million. Understanding and respecting that there's different narratives and dialogues and not trying to usurp that story, I think is really where we're gonna find more collaboration, um, but you know, the historical trauma is a big factor that impacts how we interact and how we share. Thank you so much, Nicole. This was Thank you. Thank you. Where will the video be available? I do not know. Okay.